All right. Uh, so I'm Tim Namie, and I'm the director of the Canadian Institute for Substance Use Research, otherwise known as CSER. And first off, thanks so much to everyone for being here. And thanks for the to the First People's House for letting us share their beautiful space. You know, uh, last year we suffered a tremendous loss that was felt across many communities and spheres. And one of those spheres was in the area of substance use uh, and alcohol in particular. So today we're going to talk about Harold Johnson, and he's in our hearts and our minds. He encouraged us to have the clarity and courage to change the story, in quotes, about alcohol, whether through individual awareness and change or through collective action. Harold knew and understood alcohol in its many dimensions, through the communities in which he lived and worked, through the eyes of the criminal justice system in his role as Crown Prosecutor, through policy advocacy with the Northern Alcohol Strategy, and through his reflections as an acclaimed writer. We at CSER were very lucky for Harold's partnership on the Canadian Alcohol Policy Evaluation Project. And until at the time of his passing, Harold also served with several CSER scientists as member of, of the panel that developed the recently released Canadian guidance on alcohol and health. Because of all he's done and who he was, CSER felt compelled to establish an annual award in his name. In addition to the prestige of the award, it comes with some good old fashioned cash. So Harold, knowing him a bit, would hopefully have enjoyed both the theory and the practicality of this award, whose description is as follows. The Harold Johnson Award is for an individual who has worked tirelessly and fearlessly to change the story about alcohol in order to prevent and reduce its harmful consequences for people and for populations. Reflecting the broad diversity of Harold's experiences and perspectives, the award recipient can be a community organizer, researcher, public health professional, or member of a non-governmental or governmental organization, and can work on alcohol in terms of epidemiology, treatment, advocacy, policy development, and harm reduction. Now I'll pass the microphone to Harold's delightful wife, Joan. Can I call you delightful? You are delightful. <laughs> a fellow alcohol policy advocate with the Northern Alcohol Strategy. We'll say more about Harold and then introduce our first ever award recipient. Thanks, Joan. Thank you to our elder, Paul, uh, very much for your land acknowledgement and for your opening. And to First People's House for hosting this event and, and to CSER for coming up with the Harold Johnson Memorial Award. It's, it's an honor to be here and it's an honor to speak on his behalf. Harold, I wanna tell you a little bit about him. Harold was an endless advocate as, as Tim mentioned for, for uh, particularly for al alcohol misuse, only because we saw it was rampant in our communities when we lived in northern Saskatchewan. He saw the harms and he saw he saw the depth that it affected everybody that was living in the area, whether you drank or not. And so when his second brother was killed by a drunk driver, he said, I can't do this anymore. I can't be a Crown Prosecutor anymore. I can't just put people in jail. That's not the answer. And he decided that it, the way that he wanted to proceed with that was to actually get back involved with community. And that's when Northern Alcohol Strategy started. So there was Harold, myself, Carla Froehog were the beginning. Andrea Cowan, who's here, uh, joined us too, and Bernie became a part of it as well. We were really dedicated to reducing the harms from alcohol in Saskatchewan in general, but particularly in northern Saskatchewan. But I want to tell you too about where he came from. He was um, a member of Montreal Lake Cree Nation. But he was brought up on the trap line with his, with his mom who was Cree and his dad that was Swedish. He learned how to garden from his dad that was Swedish and he learned how to hunt, trap and fish from his mom who was Cree. <laughs> and he 
went on, as was mentioned by Tim, he went on to do other things. He was a miner. He was um, he, he joined the Navy. He did many other things. And eventually he became a Crown Prosecutor after he went to Harvard and got a master's degree in law. A, a, a boy with that went against all the odds to go to Harvard and get a master's degree was phenomenal. So he became fairly well respected in the communities when we moved back. And when we moved back and built our cabin on a trap line at Montreal Lake, the north end of Montreal Lake, it was, he had to move back. He had to come back to the land. It was really important because he was burnt out. He was tired. He had, his flame was really dim. He, both of us had to come and be fed from the land. So he really understood land-based healing. He understood that from, from his heart, from who he was as a person. And across the lake from us, not very far, our probably closest and most frequent visitor was Jarrett Nelson. And Jarrett was, first of all, Jarrett's done many things too. He was a counselor for Montreal Lake Cree Nation, or he's a member of Montreal Cree Lake Nation as well. He was on council for probably close to a decade and uh, recognized after that period of time that he needed to do something different was because being an, a politician isn't making the changes that are necessary for the people. And so Jarrett ended up taking the time. He was raised by his grandfather who taught him all of the skills that, that were necessary to be able to uh, survive and thrive in our, in our lands. And um, Harold and him had frequent, and me, we had frequent visits and fed one another in many ways. And I'm thrilled to say that he's the first recipient of the Harold Johnson Award, because this is the spirit of changing the story. This is what it's all about. This is what it means. Jarrett? This hybrid event is always pretty great. Wow. Um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge our elder um, being uh, born and raised uh, in the bush. I always consider myself a bush kid. Uh, being raised in the trap line with my elders, my parents, uh, my extended family, we always acknowledge the elders every day, every morning, and before we go to bed. So I want to thank uh, Elder Josephine Dick for the welcoming, welcoming presence, welcoming prayer, and welcoming invite to your territories. Um, as a visitor to these territories, and wherever I may go in life, I always express my gratitude and respect to the Songhees, Esquimalt, Nusanich, nations, those rights and titles, and relationship with the land continue to this day. I, hey, we acknowledge everybody wherever we travel because we are one big community. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today was community, because that's what is missing within our nations. And I'll kind of just describe to you what community might look like to me. Um, we all have our own opinions and views on what community look like. So, uh, I greet you all. So it's, um, I'm kind of shaky because I'm nervous. Um, I'm also excited. It's an honor. Um, I spend, Almost all my time in the bush, it's it's not often I come to a big city, a university, so it's it's overwhelming for me right now. I'll settle in. It's it's just me getting those little 
uh, jitters out. And I also want to thank Tim, you know, for recognizing the work that I've done, the work that we've done. Um, it's not always about us. It's about what we can do for the greater good of our people. And being recognized for something as special as this, uh, my mentor, my elder, I, um, I have a lot of work to do because back home we, we are challenged. And when I say challenged, we are challenged because uh, we, we lack everything. And I'll get into those stories. But um, when I say we lack everything, we also have everything. So it's like changing the story, flipping the script and flipping how you think about things. And we are strong people. It's just that we got to find the people that fit into that community to help drive mm -hmm. that community. So it is um, very honored. Thank you very much, Tim, and your organization, Caesar. Um, Joan, um, I look to her as also my mentor and my elder uh, for many years. Of course, we would visit. And um, back in Malinosa, that was a community. And um, I'll, I'll describe to you Malinosa with uh, a little further down into my talks here. But uh, there is, um, my heart still lies there. I, I still take, of, take care of uh, Joan and Harold's camp. I still maintain it like I would maintain my trap line, my home. And uh, it's an honor and thank you, Joan, for, for having us here and for taking care of us here. It's, um, there's no words to describe how I feel right now. It's, it's heartfelt, it's, it's warming here, it's inviting. And I feel good here because I'm one with the trees. It's a beautiful university. It's a beautiful, you know, this first people's house is amazing. And I, I say thank you to the local First Nations people here in, in your home. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, about Harold and his work and how he shaped um, not only myself, but individuals within my community, uh, within my territory, and within the province of Saskatchewan and Canada, because I have friends right across this continent. I have um, relatives. And that is my connection to Harold because a lot of those people talk about Harold. And I enjoy talking about Harold because he is the guy that, that stepped out of his comfort zone. And, and I'm going to call it, he, he battled the sleeping giant that nobody else wants to touch. And it's, it's given me courage. Um, and I'm going to say the power to, to try and make change. Because at a point in my life, I didn't feel like I belonged. Like anything in that community was worth living for. And I'll get into, I'll describe a bit of what that community looks like. And the, the challenges of my people that we all share and have within every territory. And it's the, the drugs and alcohol but also the effects of drugs and alcohol and where it comes from. And where do we go from here is the question. And those are many thoughts that me and Aaron and Joan had at the cabin was where do we go from here? How do we do this? Who do we work with? And so if we look back in history, um, the warriors of the time before the Indian Act always traveled and met with other nations to gather information, to build alliances, to work together. That is what we needed to do, and that's what I see today. I see the bigger picture. So it's, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, I don't even know what to say because it, it feels overwhelming, and I still can't believe it. When, when we landed in Victoria yesterday, we went for a walk to the breakwater, and I was telling my fiance, Dina, that I still can't believe that we're here. It's, <laughs> You know, it's uh, last four, last four and a half years we haven't flown anywhere. Uh, not only due to COVID, but I continue to do my work on the land within the land-based student program, and that's my that was my vision. And Harold and Joan were my support, 
and that is what community is. So a little bit, um, a little bit more about Harold. Is uh, back home when we, me and Harold grew up in the same. I'm not going to say the same decade, but obviously he's a little older than me. But I grew up with the same men that he was surrounded with. So I know what life looked like then as well. How that community looked like. Because where Harold grew up is where my family comes from. So I know the dynamics. I know the history. I know who the leaders were within that community. And when I say leaders, they, they weren't elected chief of council. They were leaders and headmen and head women of each family that come together, bought together ideas, shared ideas, and made a plan together for the greater good of our community. So going back to those those values, uh, those teachings, Harold was always the guy that would keep me in line, and, and I, I say that nicely because my view and opinion on life was based on my surroundings, and that was the reserve. Uh, that was my little hamlet of the Akron. That was Lorange. And we had a lot of addiction. So during my younger years, I thought it was normal to drink alcohol and have fun with everybody else. And I'm proud to say that uh, you know, both of us, me and my spouse, we've been sober for almost five years but that's thing a lot of that i have to thank Aaron Joan for because they showed me what living a good life was and what <clears throat> healthy living is all about because i never seen that anywhere else and our children never see that mm -hmm. so then when i first started sitting with harold and my first ever sweat with harold he was an honest man, and I truly believe it takes an honest man to change the story because I grew up in an era and a community where people talked it but didn't walk it. And as, as me growing up as a young man, I was always observing, I'm always watching, so I gotta keep in mind that the kids are always watching. So when I did that, things started to change for me. Um, they, they changed, if, if I want to look at it this way, they changed in a good way, they changed in a bad way. But it, it's all about that perspective. And it changed in a good way because I've learned my culture, I'm studying our spiritual ways, the connection to the, the Creator, and you know the protocols, the sweats, the drumming, I'm learning more about the night ceremonies, about the shaking tent ceremonies, because it was a part of our culture and who we are. And um, I have to, I will definitely share that story as to how we lost it. So it made me stronger, it made me more confident as a woodland cream man. It made me confident knowing that I can live a good life and still show these kids that we do have healthy there is still warriors within our community. Because it's, um, it's just that Harold was one of those guys and he, <laughs> he told me like it was. He didn't beat around the bush. And he did. Whether I want to hear it or not, he's going to tell me. And that's what we don't have in our communities. It's people sugarcoat stuff. They go around it. They, oh, it's okay. It's okay to be like that. But in fact, it's not okay. Let's just be honest with ourselves. And to truly understand myself and know who I am, I had to be honest with myself as well. And he taught me that. And that was one of our many visits where I picked up just a little bit. Harry was, Harold was a good storyteller. He would tell me just enough to know and to think about it, but not give me the answer. I had to go and search for that. And it all made sense because that is what my grandfather and them did. That is what my uncles and them did. But I was during my journey in the community where I, I drank alcohol to fit in, I lost all of that. Mm -hmm. I lost meaning to what the family and community really is. And it's like, it just come to me that this is what I need. This is my community, these are my people, and we may be small in numbers, but 
you know, we will grow if we, we walk right back and show these kids right back. And uh, as Joan mentioned, um, I was raised by my grandparents, and to this day I'm thankful for that. And as, as Harold would be thankful for the way he grew up. Because those were our guidance, our mental health therapists, those were our counselors, and those were our educators. Uh, my whole life has been spent around elders. And I, I find it funny, and I didn't realize that until uh, my daughter, she was probably about 14 or 15, and she, she asked me one day, and she said, hey, Dad, like, how come all your friends are old? <laughs> and, you know, and I, I didn't think of it that way, because those were, those were the individuals that I hung out with my whole life. My whole upbringing revolved around elders. Sitting there, listening to those stories, and Harold brought me back to that, because Sitting at his house and just listening taught me so much. One of the elders had told me at, at one time when I was starting to like slip away into the other road, he says, um, why do you listen to respond? And I thought about it for a while. He says, you listen to understand. You don't always have to respond. Because I was always thinking of the answer as they were talking, I had to respond right away. And that's what colonialism did to us. That's what it did to us because all the fear, the authority, uh, we were basically punished and you know, marginalized where we didn't even mean anything. And we created that story in our heads where, you know, we're that drunken Indian that that's all we're going to be. And after like all the mentorship and the listening to Harold talk and many others that worked with Harold, I learned so much from them. I have those individuals, and there's so many to think that if, if it wasn't for them coming into my life at the right time, I don't think I would be here today. I don't think I would be here sharing with you today. And I know that for a fact. And it all ties to my upbringing, my friends at home, and uh, my friends that have helped also helped change my life to see what challenges they went through and you know I didn't have to go through some of those challenges thank you to my grandparents and the traveling that connection to the land but it's like um, I don't know I, I there's so much I can share about Harold it's just that um, I know he's with us today I thank you every day. Because I'm here. And I have a purpose now. Because back then I didn't have a purpose. I didn't see why life was worth living or why should I work in the area that I work now. Because nothing was clear. Nothing was clear in my head. But that's because I drank. That's because I tried to fit into a group where I didn't belong. So I was just trying to be somebody I wasn't until I finally started learning about myself, my family, my history. I got to have some powerful stories that I just learned last week from my 84-year-old uncle that I did not know about my family and community. It was hidden. So now it's so fun. And uh, it's, it just fits well with what this quote is in what I wrote, and I just sat the other day thinking about what am I going to say? What am I going to do? And I like to speak from the heart, but I also like to. I'm one of those guys that likes to rush myself, so sometimes when I think of something, I have to write it. And I actually learned that from Harold, because during one of our visits having coffee, he's got this beautiful cap, this beautiful cabin on the north side of uh, Montreal Lake. You know, as you pull in with the boat, you go on this nice dock with this lush green grass and the nice cabins. And you walk in, there's a stairwell to the loft. It's a beautiful cabin. I've sat there many times. And I always ask her that thing. I hated, I hated school. I hated writing. Because I couldn't sit still. And 
because of the way I was raised, we had to do everything based on the sunlight. So we were rushing every day to get the job done. That's how I was raised, based on the sun. And so that was my whole life of rushing, rushing, rushing. And my grandpa is one of those guys that didn't let us sit around and just work to be done, he did it. Um, so learning to slow myself down, and I'm, I'm working on it, I'm still not there. And I finally asked Harold, I said, okay, like, with all these books you wrote, how do you remember all this stuff? <laughs> I can't remember yesterday. So he started laughing, and uh, Harold being the guy he is, he just says, you know what? He says, sometimes if I have a dream, I wake up in the morning, whether it be four in the morning, five in the morning, while that dream is still fresh, I go up into the loft and I have a desk and I look out into the bay and I call that the Bay of Dreams, he said. And I remember that dream and I start writing. Until I finish writing and I go back to sleep or I just have coffee. Or I get to work. Mm -hmm. Where Harold and Joan lived was a new, unique place. That's where his family comes from. He lived right beside where the adhesion to Treaty 6 was signed on February 11th, 1889. Under Chief William Charles and James Roberts, the black one engineering guy. Very powerful place. And you could feel it there. You could still feel our ancestors there. So when Joan said that Harold had to go home and he had to be there, I knew why he was going there. That was his connection to his ancestors, right? And that's what I just, uh, my journey in the last five years, I've started to understand that more. The journey to my elders, to the spirit group, uh, through ceremony, and all those teachings. And Harold and Joan lived in a spot that was semi-remote. Can only get there by boat or snowmobile. And they worked an hour away from Lorange and they did that every day for 20 years. So you imagine jumping on a boat, driving to your truck, driving an hour with your truck to Lorange, doing a full eight hour work day, maybe longer because he flew to the northern communities, and having to drive home sometimes they'd probably get home at midnight, one two in the morning. But that's the thing about growing up on the land. Time didn't matter as long as we achieved what we had set out to do that day, that week, that month. That is the power of the land. And so, you know, this, just by watching Harold and observing Harold, I learned so much. He didn't even have to talk to me. I just watched him. So it's kind of how I live my life now. I gotta watch what I do, I walk the talk, and if I say I'm going to do something, I will do it, regardless of who I commit to. And um, the effects, you know, in our book, we see today the reality that we live. The genocide that it has done on our people as human beings, we always try, we always try to find a way to deal with the hurt, the pains, the grief, and certainly the traumas that we continue to experience. We find ourselves living in an environment of marginalization that we are not recognized as human beings, that we have a way of life, we have an understanding of our relationship, relationship that we should have with our people that have always believed in there was a higher power. And that's what we call the creator. So, you know, that's, that, I wouldn't be saying that to you here today if it wasn't for Harold. He made me truly understand our connection, not only to the land, but all relations. That's just not every human being that I come across. That's the trees, the birds, the animals, the water, the fish, the plants. And that is where the healing is. Once we truly understand who we are and where we come from, that is where we belong. That is your community. Right now we're, we're living in a community where we don't know where we belong. We don't know how, how, to, how to have purpose or what purpose is or what purpose is. Oh, it's, um, and as Joan said earlier, I'm a proud member of my trolley Cree Nation. I serve my community with honor, with respect. After that decade in politics, um, I can honestly say it was making me a person that I didn't want to be. I was uh, Jared Nelson, the, was the trapper, the hunter, the fisherman, the gatherer, the log cabin builder. And I was stepping into the world that was totally opposite. I was stepping into an environment that 
It wasn't necessarily my path, and I could feel it. I could understand it. And I knew that it wasn't for me. And the whole drawing part of, of all of that was my last term in office, my last year, I had two important portfolios. I had child welfare and I had health services. We were challenged because of addiction, the trauma, the intergenerational trauma that we have in our communities, everything that has happened to majority of my people in residential school, the abuse, everything. It just spilled over into my community. It was too much. And then watching the children, the next four generations suffer through this, live through it. And in my opinion, it wasn't getting any better. That's just my opinion. I've lived on reserve for almost probably 15 years of my life. I've been here for 42 winters. And those 15 years taught me a lot. And it showed me that the harsh realities of what our kids were living through. And I have to ask myself one day, do you want your kids to look like that? Do you want your grandkids to look like that? And I couldn't see myself answering that question while I was in council because I was too spread thin. I was too busy chasing government, chasing funding, chasing everything. At the end of it all, I lost everything. So now where do I rebuild myself? I went back home to my grandparents, you know, just to talk about it, see what they thought, because that was, really, that was my guide. Uh, those were like my mentors, and my direction, that's what they did. And my grandparents suffered a lot in life. And a lot of people don't know the story, like many other nations, people don't understand their stories as to what happened to us. I come from four generations from my grandfather's side that I'm aware of, that I know of, that I understand. And we were displaced people. I'll just quickly describe what I mean by that. In the year 1927-1928, my family resided on Kingsmere Lake in what is now called the Prince Albert National Park. Through the stories of my great grandmother and my grandfather, great grandfather who raised me as well as a young kid, not only at home in the community but at fish camp and at trap line. And hearing their stories, I was a child sitting back listening to elders tell stories, and I can still remember them clearly to this day. They were forced out at gunpoint. Basically, told by the park wardens that were assigned to that area and the RCP, grab what you need and leave. So my grandfather was, uh, great-grandfather Frank was considered Métis, his mom was from Montreal Lake, his dad was good. Mary, my great-grandmother Mary, whose parents were both First Nations people from Montreal Lake Cree Nation, who still lived in the reserve. So when they left the Prince Albert National Park by canoe, they come down this beautiful river called the Boskis River. And it flows right into Montreal Lake, right where the reserve sits. It actually flows into the reserve line. They followed that path because that was our highway. And during that time, we were considered Bill C 31s. So we were not allowed to stay on reserve. We were not allowed to work on reserve. And we could only come there with a pass to get groceries and leave again. So we were also displaced from our own reserve, our own community. And majority of those people banded together and stayed together that were forced out of the National Park. And that's Harold's family as well. The Johnsons, the Bradfields, the Hendersons, the Nelsons, the Rosses, the Halkins. I know all of them. And I had a better understanding of that history thanks to Harold, because he helped me fill those gaps in the story. Now, we moved to Montreal Lake, actually at the north end. At that time, it didn't have the name Mall of Seal. So Montreal Lake, if you take the first two letters of every word, it's Montreal Lake, Northern Saskatchewan, Mall of Seal. 
That is how they describe their living space. Because at the time, if you, you wanted a post office, you wanted a school, you needed a name and a, an actual location. So that is what the men decided amongst the community. And Harold's father and, and mother, and I know my grandfather, many others sat at that table to discuss that. So here we are, where we weren't wanted in the wrong driver. That was uh, another story. The reserve didn't want us. Uh, we were told that the white community didn't want us. So we were the survivors. We were the original people still living on the land and we still live there to this day. We still know and understand commercial fishing, hunting, trapping, forestry. And if it weren't for those, I would definitely not be the man I am today. Harold was very instrumental in bringing people back to Malanosa. Because at one time, I remember, there were probably only two families living there. Harold moved back, people followed him. To one point where I think there was almost 15 families living around Malanosa. It's very powerful how one man walking in Amish shoes can change the story. And he's changed the story in many ways to all of us. And so that little piece of me and my upbringing was there. Yes, of course, I've seen alcohol throughout my family, my whole life, my whole upbringing. That was where I normalized it. That's where I thought it was okay to do that. And uh, that journey of my own, you know, into knowing and understanding my purpose, because that's what it is at the end of the day, when I look back at everything is, I had a purpose, I just didn't know where I fit in. I just didn't know what life was supposed to be like, or how I was tied into all of this. And my family was uh, of the Anglican faith, again, pushed on us by residential schools. And so I, I knew about going to church. I knew about, you know, listening to the priest and how ceremony there was conducted. Um, to the point where seven o'clock every Sunday morning, my grandpa would send me and uh, uh, one of my late el elders and friends who had just passed on here recently, his name is John Brown. We would go and shovel the whole driveway, which was probably 200 yards long by probably 30 yards wide, and we would shovel that by hand. Seven o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, and then have a fire for everybody to congregate on that name. So that was what I knew and understand as to being our family's faith, until I really started digging. Until I really started listening to Harold and understanding what his family went through. I said, okay, so our families live together. Mine's got to be the same. There's got to be something out there. And it was. And that's the story that it, I was just talking about earlier, where I just found out last week from my 84 year old uncle who still lives at the trap line off the grid, still hauls his own water. Still cuts his own wood, still tends to the dogs. And um, I was working on building another log cabin. So I had to drag all the logs to the camp. I was peeling on his land in the last time. And I said, Uncle, no, no, this is how it went. He says, Oh, I see you took your sweat lodge up. I said, Yeah, Uncle. He said, It's, um, you know, we had heavy snow this year, we almost had four feet of snow. I said that they kind of caved in on one side, so my elder and mentor, Mushroom Bunny, told me, you know, take it apart. You know what to do. Just do your protocols, take it apart. We'll build a new one with you and we'll teach them how to do that. And that's that's the nice thing that I know about Mushroom Bunny, and that's, that's my elder now. He takes a little bit of time to teach these kids the protocols, the meanings, to make them understand. He lets them ask questions. Uh, when we were in church, we never got a chance to do that. I was just all about to do it. This is who you are. So that also taught me how to approach and how to change my thinking and my teaching, which I'm thankful for. And uh, so that was going back to Uncle Bob. I said, uh, so in my mind, I was thinking, okay, while he's talking about sweat lodges, I'm going to ask him more questions. 
My uncle is one of those last gentlemen in our territory that swore to his parents, if they told him something, he would never tell. Secrecy. I was trying to understand where we come from here. And I said, uncle, I said, I said do, you, do you remember that I built a sweat lodge for four years ago? You remember that? I said, that spot was right there. I said, do you realize it was 34 years since we had a sweat lodge in our yard? And he looks at me with a stern voice, how do you know that? And I never heard my uncle talk like that before because he's a quiet, laid back guy. And I said, I remember that because I was here with you and great grandpa. We were fixing the outboard motor, getting ready for commercial fishing. And he went to what I know now is a sweat lodge because while we were building that sweat lodge and while we were having the sweat, I was having flashbacks of seeing him. And I even know the tree where I hid behind watching him. And I remember him at the dock telling, telling me, please stay here with your uncle, do not follow me. What did I do? Follow me. Mm -hmm. I resisted. You know, I was hiding behind trees, it was a thick bush, really thick. I now have my camp there, I've cleaned that up a bit. I seen him go in this little shelter. I was wondering what it was. And I, just before he went into the door, he looked back and he seen me there and he sent me back again with a stern voice. He told me not to say anything. So now understanding that, I did not know that my family had to hide that from the Anglican faith because if they got caught, they would go to jail. What they were told was they were practicing the devil's work. So then they're like, like, okay, all of this is coming back to me now and this is thankful for ceremony for, for guiding me the, this way and showing me this because I would have probably would have never remembered that event in my life when I was five years old. Uh, that year my great grandfather died. So I lost that knowledge from there on in. Then I said, um, okay, uncle, like, you gotta tell me more. Tell me about grandpa. He went on my sister. What do you want to know? Like, what? I said, did we practice the drumming, the rattle, the pipe ceremony and the pipe was popping? Did we pray with the pipe? Did we do the shaking tent ceremony? And again, he said, we stopped and he went on the shaking tent. So I described him to him what it was and what it looked like. That way he says, yeah, we did it. And I was thinking, I like, uncle, how come you didn't tell me this a long time ago? And that is when he told me the true history of what was happening. He says, I swore to my mom that I would never tell because she told me not to. And that's how much respect they had for not only their parents, but their elders, their mentors, their spiritual people. And you know, it's, um, and don't get me wrong, like it's, uh, that's my journey. And whatever faith anybody believes in, I always tell them that's the right way. That's the right way. If it helps you, that's the right way. Because we were raised on the land not to force anything upon anybody or on nature or on time. Take your time, you, know, you will achieve everything. You don't need to rush it. So, learning that again, learning to slow myself down, I had to remember those teachings. And now, all, now I know about all the ceremony with not only my family, but greater community of Malanosa and Liaqua. So there was ceremonies there. There was you know, our spiritual connection. And then learning some of the stories as to who I am and where I come from. And we were always taught to introduce yourself. I, I've still not got my spirit name in ceremony only because I just started learning this. And, I, and this is just my opinion again. I've never made the time to request that to my elder because everything we have taught and we have learned, we have shared, we have to earn it first. We have to earn that first. And I just felt that I wasn't ready to earn that. I just didn't want to jump in and say, okay, I'm ready. But in fact, I owned my heart, I wasn't ready. Things come with time. And going back to that, it's like, it made me realize that, wow, like, it made me realize that Harold started me on that, 
that quest to search and to know and understand. Like I said, he always told me little bits, mm -hmm. but it was up to me to find out. Well, this is one part of my story that I'm just starting to find out. And it's been hidden from me for four generations. And then uh, further on into that discussion and changing the story, <coughs> he said he was proud of me and that, you know, it's, uh, you're, you're learning to be who you were supposed to be. That's what he said to me. And I, I, I started recording him late. He didn't know I was recording because he knew I was recording him. I needed for my own, not to share with anybody, but for myself to hear him saying that to make me truly validate I am who I am and be proud of it. So, like I said, for a long time, a lot of us don't know who we are, don't know what purpose we have because we are not a part of a community. And um, he, he shared quickly two little stories about, he says, you know when you used to go downstairs with your great grandfather? I said, yeah, I remember that. He said, he used to teach you how to use his tools, because my grandfather was a craftsman and make snowshoes, boats, cabins, any tool that you needed to survive in the bush and make it. So I, I was always fascinated with his draw knives, or his healing strips of wood and everything. And he was also like to express himself apart, so he'd draw moose or different you know, scenes. So he was showing me how to draw moose heads and everything else, and those pictures are actually still downstairs at our place in the afternoon. And he says, you know your grandpa used to always tell us in Korea, he says, you watch this kid, you take care of him, and you teach him. He says, there's something about him. And the only way my uncle has it in his, his works that where I recorded him was, he says, he's ahead of his time. And my uncle Bob just says, I don't know what he was talking about, but I just knew that I had to teach him. Your grandpa knew that he had to teach him. So... My great-grandfather dies when I'm, I'm five. I continued living with my Uncle Bob and my great-grandmother Mary until I was 16 when she passed. And she died at the age of 97. And all those values, those traditions that she kept alive through story, where I sat with her and just listened to her. And she never understood or spoke English, just Greek. When she wrote out a grocery list, it was in syllabics. So I could understand syllabics at that time because I was a grocery runner. I could run to the store and grab her stuff, right? So going back to those stories, and then going back to my grandpa and then my uncle Bob, and as a child, I didn't have a summer holiday. I didn't have a childhood, I'll put it that way. And I always wondered why. As soon as school was out, I'd get dragged off to either a trout line, to fish camp, to hunt, to pick berries, to learn how to fish. And little did I know that they were just listening to their dad to teach me all this stuff. <clears throat> all these steps of living off the land, knowing where to live off the land in certain seasons because we traveled to the seasons. A lot of my life, I lived in a tiny little log cabin that was probably about 10 by 12, for three of us in there. My grandpa and my uncle. In the summertime, we lived in a canvas tent. And we moved with the seasons. And now I look back at those areas today, like those are sacred sites. Those are, I didn't understand it. I, I just knew my connection to those areas and to, for them to get me to know and understand the importance of that place. They had to make me spend time there. I was connected to that place. So now I know where the medicines are, I know where the animals are, I know where the berries are, the trees are for the harvest, for the, the cabins. And our connection to that land, and how the trees live together through the root systems as a community. And one of the, the warnings I can say that my great grandmother gave me before she had passed, was she, she goes, you're coming into a life, into a stage in your life where you have to watch out for people that are like of the poplar tree. That's all she told me. But it was so profound and it, it, it stayed in my mind forever. But like, like again, it, it gives you enough to think about it and you have to chase that answer. 
And it's like a lesson. So, now I truly understand what she was saying. Because my community, my people were strong as of this spruce tree. It gives you shelter, it gives you medicine, it gives you everything you need. And not to say that all trees are not beautiful, but they have meaning to them. And I'm only talking specifically to our territory. And later on, I finally asked my grandpa while we are out hunting at Bull Moose Beach. We were around the fire, just waiting for nightfall for the moose to come into the water and we start battling. And I finally asked him about grandma. I said, you know what? I, I still don't understand what grandma was telling me. Can you help me? I'm not sure if you can help me answer or understand, but this is what she said to me. And he goes, yeah. He says, I don't know what she was just preparing me. I knew that we were going to leave for a bit. And I'm thinking that she told me that she already knew that I was going to go into politics or something. Um, that story about the poplar tree, my grandpa explained it. That's the greatest blue we're camping yet. He says, look at these poplar trees right there. They're huge, they're nice, they're massive, they're mature. Those are, you know, the beans. All she was telling me was as beautiful as they may look, a mature poplar tree is always rotten in the inside. Mm -hmm. I saying, okay, well, what does that mean? <laughs> You'll figure it out, he said. I knew what he meant. That they were preparing me for what I was about to step into. I can truly say I started learning what a poplar tree was when I was in politics. <laughs> yeah, I can truly understand, but without that teaching or that meaning, I think I would have fell into the pop, the growth of the pop trees. Because that's what I see happening to a lot of people. So she says, you have multiple trees within your community, we all share land together. Just remember that. So people can change, they can become part of the community. But they need that guidance, that love, that support. And it's uh, something I'll never forget. And my community, we've lost the old people with the old stories. Now, as I said earlier, we've always traveled. We've always met with other nations. We've always learned with other nations. We've always shared with other nations. Whether that be food, just socializing. We're learning from each other through the power of story. So I started reaching out. And there was individuals that you know I personally would like to acknowledge that have shown me the way in talk. Because one of my brothers is Dr. Simon Burke. And he has a Facebook page that's called Craig Simon Says. He's trying to teach the younger generations through social media how to speak our language understand who we are and it's it's amazing what he's done and he's done it on his own time and I have another friend and a brother whose name is Dr. Kevin Lewis from the ministry you want to talk about old stories powerful stories stories that give you meaning and purpose stories that tell you who you are you know, that, that's the man to go and visit that's the home fire go and sit and have tea with Because our whole upbringing is sitting there and having tea with knowledge keepers. And so once I lost my grandfather, my great-grandfather, I lost Harold. I needed to reach out, that meant I had to go further. I had to leave the reserve, I had to leave my territory to go and visit knowledge keepers that were of the same belief. And I started picking up these stories and things started making sense in my life. My purpose, my stories, our stories. You know, it's uh, very powerful. It's and when Harold called his last book "The Power of Story," that's the perfect title. Mm -hmm. That is what everybody needs to learn: is the power of story, because it makes up who we are. We start believing the stories, and it it's who we become. And the. Um, and the power of story after I left politics, and after my two 
challenging portfolios. I said, I can't do this anymore. I, I gotta go back to who I am and where I come from. So I left, I left politics for a bit and I went to stay at the trap line and just reconnected with the people of the land and spent many visits, having coffee. Very strong coffee, I tell you that. But I love it now. I just have to learn enough times that I love strong coffee. Um, myself and one of my best friends and mentors as well, her name is Joyce Knight from Solo First Nation. Joyce Knight is a mental health therapist, an elder, a knowledge keeper, very wise. We come up with us this idea to help child family services. And we see the dysfunction in our community, the addiction, the intergenerational traumas that we spoke about, stuff we all know about, I don't need to describe that. We seen what was happening with our people when they went to detox, when they went to rehab. And the thinking was that why don't we do this ourselves in our own territory, with our own beliefs, with our own way of life, and bring our people back to who they should be. And I didn't get it at first because you gotta remember that this was before I really started truly learning and understanding who I was and where my spirit was. So I said, okay, I said, I'm in, let's do it. Because I don't like sending my friends to rehab and detox. And these friends are like my brothers. Seeing what they grew up in, seeing the houses they grew up in, the environment they grew up in. I knew it wasn't gonna change unless we changed the story ourselves. I couldn't rely on government. Look at what government's done for our community. You know, we're, we're sitting in this invisible fence called the reserve and we think we can't get out of there. So to empower our people and to help our people live a healthier life, show them the meaning and purpose in life, we helped design and develop the first ever land-based family therapeutic program in Canada that was called CAPCO. The stats of sending our people to rehab and detox, to my knowledge, and the numbers we knew at the health center, was a success rate of two to five percent, somewhere in there. Those are numbers I can only give you because I don't truly really understand, but I'd be safe to say it was two percent. Now, Camp Pope, we didn't just work on the individuals, we worked on the families. The family as a unit, just like we would in the trap line. Everybody lives together and works together as a family. Everybody has purpose. Everybody's got a job every day that you wake up. And we pull this together through the, the day of the, as long as the sun. So to knowing and understanding those backgrounds, and my understanding of where I am and where I come from, knowing what I know now about hunting, trapping, fishing, the spiritual connection, the gathering, where to go, when to go. We bought all that together and created that program in Camp Hope. Camp Hope, when we, we finished, and I say finished, I, was, uh, I, I helped build it, we helped uh, design it, we bought in resources from the majority of the community because I tried to empower my people by saying, hey, we can do this together. So I picked the people, or we picked the people that we knew could do the job for specific areas, for childcare, mentorship, uh, taking the adults out to the reserves or whatever, the trees, fun at the park. And I'm proud to say that our success rate was 78%. That is community. That's what community does. Community does not send our people out in a way to go and get help where it doesn't work. In fact, we send our people out to get more traumatized because we're sending them to a, a place that's foreign to them, that they don't belong. They're learning something that is of Western science that really doesn't apply to us and our being. And to the ones that did make it through, I applaud you because I need you, we need you in our communities to help show that you walk in the good way. 
and the approach that Joyce had, and through my observation, again, I'm not a mental health therapist, I'm just a bush kid. I was trying to help others heal with the ways that I know. And her approach was, I'll put it this way, when she went to school to get her mental health degree, she's also got her PhD, she was taught to treat the mind in Western science. We as First Nations people, we work on the heart and the spirit. So she found a way of fusing those two together and creating a program that worked for our people where they could truly understand why they are the way they are and why our community is the way it is in the last four generations. So once you make that path and that visibility clear for our people to truly understand what has happened, why I am the way I am, and why things are the way they are, and if you give them those answers, then they can truly understand who they are and where they come from. Because right now, all of our people are finding ways to try and fit into today's society. And Camp Hope was amazing, it was beautiful. Harold and Joan used to come visit us there and encourage us. And uh, I just remember one visit when we come to graduation, we had a six week program. So we took the families in for six weeks. Day in and day out, 16 hours a day, I was with them. And I also got to stop to acknowledge my families for supporting me because they let me be away from them to do this important work. And without them, I couldn't have done that. Those families finally understood who they were. And by Harold being there, it meant even more because they knew what Harold was doing. They knew the work he was doing. They knew he was writing these books. He shared his books. He shared his knowledge. And he encouraged them. That was powerful. That is what we need to be. That is what we need to show to walk in a good way. You know, one of the best compliments that I heard Harold say was, you know what, you're doing the right thing. Your ancestors put you here for a reason. And I remember those words to this day. Now me knowing what I know now from my uncle telling me about our spiritual side, he already knew. He says, I had to figure that out on my own time. There's always a time to figure things out, but I couldn't rush it. And Changing our stories in our communities all starts with us, each and every one of us. It's not up to the chief and council because I hear that too often. It's all oh, the chief and council, what are they doing? What are they doing about it? No, it's not just our chief and council. As my grandfather said, when you're pointing the finger at one person, you have three of them pointing back at you. What about you? Where, what are you doing? Instead of complaining, what are you doing? Ask yourself that three times. So I don't blame anybody anymore. I take ownership and I try and find a way to become a part of a healthy community that's gonna have the drive to do something for the greater good of our seven generations to come. So I'm a father and I'm a grandfather now and it's changed my life tremendously. And that is the community I talk about. Where we live in our reserves is a place where we're just trying to survive. That is it. We're not even thriving, we're surviving. If we learn to go back to the land through the powers and stories of our elders, we'll start thriving. Because Mother Nature, the Creator, has everything to provide for us. We just have to know how to ask for it. Vast guidance. But we don't see much of that nowadays because with the forced assimilation and everything that's happened to our people, forced onto these little reserves, you know, I see a lot of our people sticking their hands up because the government's going to do it for us. I don't have to work. It'll give, be given to us. The chief and council's going to get it for us. When in fact, that's not the truth. That is not the honest way of looking at it. We have to be the people to change the story. We have to be the people to walk the good life, to change our behaviors and our habits. And it... it it just sounds so, it, it's so true. We, when I was in leadership, we had a suicide crisis in Montreal Lake. They come in waves. And before I had left office, I remembered that. 
just that one little line where one of the most respected elders in our community was sitting within our, our chief and council table as it looks now. The community sits on the outside to understand and listen to the deliberations. One elder was asked, what did you do back in the day when you had this problem? And the elder stood up and says, I can't help you. I don't know what you're talking about because we were too busy trying to survive. And that's all he said. And it just, it just rang through my head right there, just for a split second. And being told this and reminded us of this story from friends that, you know, through conversations, they bring up this elder talking about that. I have to take these kids back to the land. And that's what he's telling me. So like I said, elders tell you just enough, but they don't give you the answer. You gotta figure it out. You gotta put out the other half. Because it takes effort. And that's what I've learned. Everything they have taught me and told me takes my effort to truly understand what they're telling me. So I have to get off my ass every day and think about this, and think about the stories and chase the answer because it's out there. But it's up to me. If I don't ever find it, then that's on me. Nobody else, I can't blame anybody. So, through all that my journey, it's taught me so much. And then when I got into politics, the first thing I remember was my grandpa and an elder sitting me down. And that elder was Jacob Lavalley from another little hamlet, hamlet across the lake from us. It's called Timber Bay. So they were sitting there, and here I am, elected into my first term of council, and I didn't know what the hell I was getting myself into, but. I sat there and he, he, we were having a cup of tea and that's why I say the importance of having a cup of tea is you take the time to listen. So they were talking about their experience, what they've seen, what they know. And then he looks at me and says, so what's your plan? I said, my, my plan, for what? Leadership. I said, what is your plan? I said, oh, me being the guy that I was, oh, well, I'm gonna try and get more money, I'll get more funding. Uh, you know, just all these ideas. And he, he just listened to me. More than he says, no way. It's, he says, your, your plan? He says, your biggest challenge is how you treat your own people. I said, wow. Like that's just those few little words are so profound. But I, I remembered that at every decision that I made at the council table. Even though I stood alone, even though I didn't believe what was happening or decisions were being made that I felt were not right. I stated why I felt it wasn't right and if I had to oppose, I opposed. Because it just didn't feel right. And through those times, I, I learned the nerve and that he wasn't just talking about my people. So when I left Camp Hope, I joined the great team at the Prince Albert Grand Council. The Prince Albert Grand Council is made up of the 12 member First Nations in Northern Saskatchewan. Uh, we cover the treaty territories of 5, 6, 8, 10. So we are a vast area, right from central Saskatchewan all the way to the borders from each side. We have 30 communities. We are 47,000 strong. And I had a lot of work to do. So I was asked to come in and help create this program within the Grand Council that was probably, the, I'm going to say, and I can say without a doubt, it was the biggest land-based program in the province. And what I say by that is we had six communities on board. We had 120 children who were all First Nations living in the city, providing them opportunities, whether it's cultural, spiritual, traditional, whatever it may be, whatever background they come from, we supported them. I learned so much from the Dakota, the Plains Creek, the Swampy Creek, the Woodland Creek, also the Denny, those are my brothers in the north. We all did things a little differently, but we all shared the, the same challenges. So once we put all our heads together and created this program that was gonna benefit our youth, that was the plan, that was the program, we offered every community four camps per year, and these camps were a week long. 
and that was six communities, so I had 24 camps a year, one week long for every community. So I was busy like week to week to week to week for three years straight. That's all I did was land-based camps for youth. Even during COVID, we still did it. We still had a sweat at every camp. And again, nobody was forced to do any of that. When uh, youth did not understand it, or young adults said, no, my, my dad said I can't do that. No, that's fine. We'll teach them another thing. Let's just talk about the seven seven teachers. So we always had something for everybody. We always took care of everybody as a community where it's safe, where they feel love, where we show them respect. More importantly, we listen to them. We stop to listen to them. They don't understand what we need to do. And you cannot create a program for anybody unless you listen to them first. That's one thing I've learned. You just take it slow. You make it about them, not you. So, that was and my other step for three years. I had probably the best three years of my life because I got to work with a, a damn good team. People that truly cared. I think there was 36 of us that. That's including all the communities that were involved. I, it, it's opened my eyes to many different ways of doing things, of seeing things and understanding things, even though they didn't talk to me. So if we can teach our kids that to be observant, and just to listen without responding, I think our communities would look different today. And it's, it's empowering to know that some of the youth I worked with during my time at the Grand Council now serve some pretty prestigious positions like within FSI and Youth Council, uh, Prince Albert Grand Council, Youth Representatives and Ambassadors. I knew all those kids and I have a connection to those kids. And for that team that was there with us during the hard times and the good times, they are a big part of that success story as to why those kids are where they are today. We are creating the new leaders of tomorrow. Because if we do not work and put our minds to helping the youth, what does that future look like for my grandson, Tulsi? What does that look like for my son's future kids that are gonna be my, my grandkids? I gotta start thinking about my grandkids. We have to start thinking about our grandkids. Even though you don't have children yet, it's gonna come. It's inevitable. You are going to be grandmother, or grandfather, great grandfather. That is who we are. That is how community is created. No more surviving. Let's start thriving. And education is just as important. I always looked down on myself growing up, and up until I met Harold, I actually still look down on myself because in the reserve, I didn't get a proper education. Because when I went outside of the reserve, I felt like I was undereducated and I didn't know what people were talking about. But that's because I didn't spend enough time in that other world. So you made me understand that the knowledge you have, be proud of it because the knowledge people are seeking, you are holding it now. And that made me look at life differently. That changed my story. Because without hearing it, Again, from somebody that's honest, I am who I am today, and I'm proud of who I am. I'm proud of who I, who I am and where I come from. I can honestly say I know who I am and where I come from. It's, um, it's been quite the journey. Um, all this work I do in land based healing, um, I'll just leave it. Uh, I like using the word land-based healing because it, it describes everything and it's kind of open to everybody because we all have different beliefs and values and I respect that. So that's a mutual word that describes everything. And without those teachings and those guidance, without those individuals that cross my path, they come across my path for a reason. 
And I'm, again, I'm, I'm just trying to know and understand and recognize that I've met people for a reason. Now, if I didn't leave the life I just told you about, and I didn't go into this path, I didn't meet Harold and Joan, I, I wouldn't be here today. And I shared that earlier. I know I wouldn't be here today. So this is my community. This is not my community. This is who I represent. You know, I will walk a good life, a clean path. I will advocate, I will mentor. I will stay true to my grandparents. I will stay true to Harold and his teachings. I will stay true to my community and my nation. And to everybody that I come across with and work with, because as my grandpa said, it's your biggest challenge is how to treat your own people. This is my people. So I've learned so much on my journey in the last five years, I could probably say seven years. I've just started getting heavily involved in this. And I knew my story wasn't being stuck on a reserve and, you know, fitting in with my buddies that drink this and say that in a bad way. I just want to show them that there's another way out. And I, I can't force them, but I, they need to learn on their own time as well. But I'm here to support them, I'm here to challenge them, I'm here to do everything for them to help them get better. And um, another individual that I always watch, and he's now in Spirit Bowl, Dave Crochet Jr. That guy I could watch for days on end and I could put his videos on repeat just by the way he speaks, the way he talks. It showed me the importance of who I am and where I come from. And I didn't even know the guy. I just know him through YouTube and presentations, and that's how powerful he was. And those, I have to also acknowledge them in the spirit world because without their teachings, I, I honestly wouldn't be here. So I have so much to be grateful for, and I always remind myself don't ever forget to acknowledge those people because those are the people that set the path for me. And it's up to me to maintain that path like a trap over there. And one of the things that I've also learned through nature and through the way I lived on the land was you can be the best trapper ever, but you can never trap the same trail every year, year after year after year. You have to put the work in and go another direction and trap that territory too. Because keep going in that area, you're going to clean everything up. You need balance. And just by those little teachings too, I learned to have balance in my life. I know I'm a workaholic too, but you know, I also need to stay down with it. Therefore, it's like um, some of the uh, growing up on the land, I've always been taught about Askitamatsu, living the good life, living off the land. And up until recently, I started truly knowing and understanding what they meant, listening to those elders talking. It's um, been quite the journey. Very honored to be here again. And it's like, I have so much to share, but I don't know where to start. I always get like that when I'm overwhelmed or I have all these notes and I don't even want to look at them because what Harold taught me too is to speak from the heart. Because the story is there, you just have to capture it and you have to share it. And um, I think I would just like to to finish by thanking everybody that I've crossed paths with in, in my lifetime, my journey. I, I continue that journey. Um, even the people that I haven't met yet, I look forward to that life look forward to the organizations that I'm going to help, to the individuals that I will serve, and more importantly to the youth that are going to change the story, that are going to break those cycles, that are going to create the new communities. And those are the leaders of tomorrow. And without our mentorship and our guidance and our walking the good life and showing them that, being that prime example, that's the only way we can achieve that. It's 
our story is not theirs, and they shouldn't be living the life that we have to live. There is another way. And so in closing, I usually leave with a message. And I will leave you with this. And my belief is the cures for all these symptoms we face as a human family is reconnecting to the planet, working in alliance with nature, and her natural laws is the key to ensuring our survival. We take the children to the land, find their identity, and learn their ancestral ways of kinship and stewardship. Always be kind, be humble, show respect, and love all creations. I thank you all. Amen.